the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In April 2017, which now seems an age ago, I started as a chaplain intern at Carlsbad by the Sea. And in my first month, I had to preach a sermon at the Sunday service. While I started to develop my first sermon, I was very apprehensive and rather anxious, even though I'd listened to many excellent sermons by Father Doran and Father Kraft. And I'd completed the humanetics course and the sermon development classes at the Episcopal School for Ministry in San Diego. We were taught to develop sermons which would paint a picture of what is happening in the passage and to reveal the underlying meaning to both Jesus' listeners and to us. The tricky part is that it was, as we listen to a sermon, it may speak to each of us differently depending on various factors such as our cultural history, education, the society we live in, what is going on in our lives that day, or even how we're feeling at that time. And it was the same for Jesus' listeners. In our passage today, we hear Jesus as a guest in the synagogue preach a sermon which is very short and very to the point, but very contentious for his community as he uses Isaiah to let the people know that he is the Messiah and lets them know the focus of his mission. We do not have many details of the service, but from what we do know of early synagogue services, the format would have been a bit like our service of the word. It has prayers, three readings and a sermon, usually given on the final reading. Their readings were all from the Hebrew Bible, the first from the Torah, the second reading from the writings, and the third reading from the prophets. We don't know if Jesus had a set lectionary, or if as a guest preacher he was allowed to choose his reading, and he offered to preach on the day that the worship contained Isaiah 61. He was given the book of the prophet Isaiah. He opened it at Isaiah 61, verse 1, and read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus only reads these few verses which prophesy the mission statement of the Messiah. Then we, told, we are told he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down, ready to preach. And then he preached his shortest sermon ever, as he just said, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing which is all he said. The sermon was just one line, but this really got their attention. It's this proclamation about the scripture being fulfilled which made this a profound event. Jesus told them what this Isaiah said the Messiah would do. And then he tells them that he's starting his ministry to fulfill this prophecy. And by this, he's telling them that he is the Messiah. By proclaiming himself as the Messiah, who will be fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy, he's actually making them think about what this would mean to their day-to-day -day lives. His listeners would have been from all backgrounds, from the poor and disenfranchised, on the one hand, to the rich and the powerful, social, and religious leaders on the other and others somewhere in between. Some, the poor, would have heard a message of hope that the Messiah has come to bring good news specifically for them, that he would be a revolutionary who would free anyone captive or in debt to the oppressive authorities 
that he would provide healing of the blind so they could participate as productive members of society. And they would have the hope of restoration when he said he will proclaim the year of the Lord, a jubilee year which happened every 50 years and when according to Leviticus all property is returned back to its original family and the original tribes. Others, the wealthy and the powerful, may have seen Jesus as a revolutionary threat to their wealth and their way of life. They would have heard that he was not bringing good news for them, but a warning to change their ways. That he would disrupt their workforce by freeing the slaves. That he would reduce their wealth by cancelling the debts of the poor. That he would challenge their religious authority by providing physical healing so that people were not beholden to them for their health proclamations. And the threat of a year of the Lord's favour would require them to change their self-centred ways and to redistribute their wealth. To those with the most to lose, this sermon would threaten their way of life so much that it would prompt them to plot his death. And others, depending on their circumstances, would have heard something in between but would have focused on how it would impact them personally. Today, with the benefit of the Gospels, hindsight, and a multitude of theological commentaries, we would hear a different meaning. As we read these words from Isaiah, we must recognize that poverty, captivity, blindness, and the need for restoration all have both physical and spiritual dimensions. We know that the good news of salvation is for all who repent and believe in Jesus, those who are physically poor and those who are poor in spirit. We know that through the forgiveness of our sins, he releases us from our bondage and our captivity to sin. In Acts, we read about Jesus giving Paul his mission to open their eyes that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive remission of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. And we know that he opens our eyes. He opens us up to the Holy Spirit he removes our spiritual blindness so we can see God through him and in one another. And we know that through him every day for us is a jubilee day, a jubilee year, as he continually restores our relationship with the one true God. He's not restoring property back to where it was 50 years ago. He's restoring this spiritual relationship that we have with God. Now Jesus knew exactly what the people needed to hear that day. And he knew exactly what he wanted to share with them. His sermon was and is one of the shortest on record. Today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. The fulfillment of this scripture began with the life, the death and the resurrection of Jesus but continues in the life of the church today. And today, through ministry, the church is helping Jesus to fulfill what he identified in these verses as a core part of his mission. And just as Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, that same Spirit has been poured out on us as we help Jesus fulfill this mission that he proclaimed as he read Isaiah in the synagogue that day. Amen.